You're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm writing you from the future. And not just any old future, your future. And I know that as soon as I say that, there will be some people who worry, worry about so-called temporal paradoxes. <laughs> For instance, what if you, specifically you, dear reader, are my grandparent, or great-grandparent, or great-great-grandparent, or let's just call it an unspecified amount of greats, because part of the mystery and fascination here is you not knowing precisely when the world as you know it plummets into dystopia. That's right, dystopia. <laughs> and if you're worried about temporal paradoxes, then you, my friend, are a temporal prude. <laughs> you, you have totally bought into heteronormative notions about time being uncompromisingly straight in its linearity. <laughs> and patriarchal notions that pure and untainted virgin timelines are the only ones worth living in. Well, unfortunately for you, time is un unapologetically queer and promiscuous. <laughs> So if my writing you from the future accidentally disrupts the so-called original timeline, no big deal. We are simply in a new timeline independent of the other one. And if someone intervenes in that timeline, then there's a third new timeline independent of the others, and so on, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. So just get over your temporal prudence already. And by the way, can I just say how selfish it is of you to be solely concerned with how my story impacts your timeline, which you think is the original virgin timeline, although I doubt that's true? When after all, I'm the person living in a dystopian future, shouldn't you be asking me how I am? <laughs> well, it's too late now. And even if you were to ask, the answer would be bad. Real bad. Because for starters, I am a teenager which by default kind of sucks. <laughs> but on top of that, I am a teenager living in a dystopian society, which sucks even more. <laughs> and given that I'm a teenager living in a dystopian future, during a time in your time period when futuristic dystopian-themed YA novels are all the rage, you are likely imagining that I live in post-apocalyptic United States, where society is now divided into districts or factions. And you probably expect me to be some sort of unlikely chosen person who ultimately, after much action, suspense, and personal transformation, <laughs> unites a divided society and overthrows our oppressive dystopian overlords. <laughs> not a chance. For one thing, I'm not even in post-apocalyptic United States. I live in Toronto. <laughs> and yes, we still call it that, even though it's dystopia. Not to mention an indefinite number of years in the future. Seriously, people don't forget the names of their cities just because an apocalypse has happened. <laughs> Lots of bad shit has gone down since the fall of the Roman Empire, but we still call it Rome. <laughs> Although we really should call it Roma, because that's what the Italians call it, and it's their city after all. <laughs> and yes, we still have Italians in this futuristic world. And they're still making the delicious Chianti wines, although they, they no longer come in those roundish bottles with the straw baskets on the bottom. Because we ran out of straw. <laughs> Which wouldn't be so bad in and of itself, except that the reason why we ran out of straw is because straw comes from wheat. Which we also ran out of. <laughs> Which is part of the reason why society plunged into dystopia. But only part of the reason. Another problem with your YA novel-derived presumption that I am some chosen one who ushers in a promising new futuristic world is this. It wouldn't be an actual dystopian society if it could be easily undermined or overthrown. <laughs> Especially by a teenager who's still in the process of finding herself as a person, as part of her so-called hero's journey. Although, it really should be heroine's journey because I prefer she, her, hers pronouns. <laughs> Although, I don't save anybody in this story. So I'm not much of a heroine, nor do I go on a journey. I just pretty much stay here in post-apocalyptic Toronto the whole entire time. <laughs> no, my dystopia is not a hopeful YA novel type. It is like that one in that novel in 1984. It is literally Orwellian, in that there's no escape. <laughs> and yes, we still have copies of that book floating around, even though an apocalypse has happened. And yes, it is sort of ironic, reading a dystopian work of fiction when you're actually living in a dystopian real-life world. <laughs> or maybe I'm confusing irony with absurdism here. I'm not sure, but whatever it is, it's all very meta. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Anyway, remember 1984, the part where the Oceanian government sent heretics to Room 101, where they faced their worst fears, such as being eaten alive by rats? Well, we have that in my world too, except that instead of calling it Room 101, my dystopian overlords call it Trans 101. And there they force you to present a workshop about transgender people and issues for an audience of cisgender people like every single day, until you are psychologically broken. This is where they have sent me, as punishment, because I was making fun of astrology, which may seem really trivial to you, but astrology is pretty much our religion here. That and reality TV shop stars, who pretty much, we pretty much worship as deities. And it's not so bad at first, the Trans 101 workshops. It feels kind of rewarding to share your personal trans-related stories with others. The participants ask you all sorts of questions that seem naive to you, but they ask them in a polite manner, so you try to answer them the best that you can. But then the second day, you immediately recognize that it's the exact same audience as the previous day. But they still have all the same questions <laughs> that you've already answered. Yet they expect you to answer them all over again, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. And if you start complaining about how you have already explained the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation to them at least a dozen times already, or if you get testy when they mess up your pronouns, even though you clearly wrote she, her, hers on the bottom of the name tag you wear each day, or reality TV, gods forbid, if you express any uh, exasperation whatsoever when they act confused about the word cisgender, if you do any of these things, they will start griping about how unreasonable or angry you are being and how you should be more patient with them, because the whole transgender thing is really confusing. <laughs> and this goes on every single day until you are at your wit's end. You can no longer take it. This is what happened to me, to a T, until an idea came to me. I stood in front of the Trans 101 workshop room, looking at all the same familiar passive-aggressive cisgender faces that have been the bane of my existence for, well, I don't quite know how long exactly because we have no calendars in the future. <laughs> Somehow we completely lost those. That's the other reason why society plummeted into dystopia, the lack of calendars, <laughs> along with the lack of wheat. It was a double whammy. <laughs> That's why I haven't been disclosing how many years have passed in the timeline between when you are and when I am, because the very concept of years has been lost to time. Yet somehow, despite losing calendars, we still have astrology. Don't ask me how that works. <laughs> anyway, I'm standing in front of my Trans 101 workshop yet again, but this time, unlike all the previous times, I say, hello, and welcome to my Cis 101 workshop. My name is Zena, because in the future, all of our names begin with Z's or X's. <laughs> and I'll be your cisgender person for today. Now, I understand, being transgender yourselves, you are probably not very familiar with cisgender identities. But no worries, that's what I'm here for. So please, feel free to ask me any of your what's it like to be cisgender questions you may have. They all looked around the room, clearly confused. I imagined that they all wanted to shout, but wait, we're the cisgender people, but then realized that if they did, they would be copying to the fact that they have understood the meaning and usefulness of the word cisgender all along, <laughs> but were merely feigning ignorance to psychologically torture me. <laughs> But they didn't do that. Instead, they started asking me sincere questions. Like, so what is it like to never had to grapple with gender dysphoria? Or, what is it like to not constantly face criticism for your failure to conform to gender norms? It became increasingly clear to me that they had bought my premise that I was cisgender and they were transgender, hook, line, and sinker. It's as if all those years of astrology, reality TV, and meekly accepting whatever our dystopian, dystopian overlords told them had weakened their critical thinking skills. It's like in 1984, where at the start of the book, Oceania is at war with Eurasia and allied with East Asia, but then one day, without any explanation, it gets reversed, and the masses passively accept. This is the thing, alliteration is awesome, but sometimes it messes you up when you give readings. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know if that's alliteration. What is that? That's, anyway, that's rhyming with another thing. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Anyway, but then one day in that 
uh, for passage, um, the, pas the masses passively accept that they had always been at war with East Asia, even though it wasn't true. Well, that's exactly what happened here, but only with gender identities. So of course, I subsequently used my newfound powers of persuasion to turn everybody transgender. Well, at least everybody in Toronto, as it is forbidden for us to ever leave our city-state, for reasons that remain mysterious, <laughs> at least until the sequel comes out. <laughs> Somehow I even managed to, to turn our dystopian overlords transgender. And once they embraced their newly found gender variant identities, they decreed that all gender norms, expectations, and assumptions shall be banished from here on forward. So now, we live in a gender utopia of sorts, where all gender identities and expressions are fully embraced and respected. But even though it's a gender utopia, it's still a dystopia in a more general sense, due to the lack of we <laughs> and calendars. You can't have everything, I guess. Thank you. <laughs>